slides and you can tell me when you see them. They're up, but not in presentation mode. Great. Oh, you can't see them in presentation mode? Yeah, if you, if you uh, click on slideshow, I think it'll convert. Oh, I already did that. Let me try oh. again. Maybe it's just a different, uh, that you need to share a different monitor. Did that work? No, still just regular. Okay, I'll try switching the. If you go up to the top where it says slideshow. Oh, there you go. Uh -huh. You got it. Got it? Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry, thank you everyone. You would think that we would be over these technical issues by now. Um, Thanks, Susan. Uh, glad to be here today and good to see so many familiar names on the participant list. I'm gonna be talking about a project that was funded by an ending the HIV epidemic supplement from the CIFAR. And I would like to acknowledge all of my co-authors up front. And with that, I'll jump right in. So an overview of the talk is that I'll start with uh, some of the community and ethical concerns about molecular HIV surveillance and cluster detection and response. I'll talk about the formative work that we did for this project, including both the methods and results. I'll touch briefly on the video development, show you our final video, and then talk a little bit about the evaluation that we've done and end with some conclusions. And I also will say if anyone has brief uh, questions, feel free to just interrupt me at some point. I'm not going to be monitoring the chat, but maybe Susan, you can break in if there are some quick questions. Otherwise, I've left about 20 to 15 to 20 minutes, and hopefully we can have some good discussion at the end. Okay, so I think a lot of you are aware, because you've seen me give these sorts of talks before, about the community and ethical concerns that have come up about the use of molecular HIV surveillance and cluster detection and response. And most of these concerns have focused on the, the issues of criminalization, consent, and confidentiality. And a lot of concerns have come up about those things particularly since 2019, I think it was 2019, when molecular HIV surveillance became required for health departments that were receiving HIV prevention funding. And then again, this has come up more because responding to clusters is pillar four of the ending the HIV epidemic, responding to outbreaks or clusters. And so this conversation is ongoing. And as an example of this, this is a paper, the title of a paper that was published last fall by the Positive Women's Network. And uh, the very next day, the CDC came out with some expanded guidance on the collection, use, and release of HIV sequence. I assume that it was in response to the paper, but I'm not sure. I just wanted to mention that to illustrate that this is a conversation that is ongoing and dynamic and there's still a lot to learn and I would say that we haven't really settled very many issues with this project but just a heads up about that. A former Ending the HIV Epidemic project that we did with Alex Shook who's first author on this paper looked at provider and community member feelings, attitudes, knowledge about molecular HIV surveillance and cluster detection and um, response. And we came up with five primary themes through that project. The fact that context matters, people who had been diagnosed and had interactions with health departments in other jurisdictions outside of King County often said that they felt that they had been treated differently than they had been if they had interacted with the health department in King County. Um, there wasn't a lot of knowledge of molecular HIV surveillance and those interviews included a lot of explanation about what it was. People were concerned about how to message this and the equitable uh, distribution of resources that come about as part of these investigations. Again, the concern about confidentiality came up and also some, some people voiced concerns that they thought that these kinds of investigations might stigmatize people, particularly populations that may be already marginalized in our county. 
So we received this supplement in 2020, and this slide shows the aims. Our community partner was Public Health Seattle and King County. Thank you, Susan. Um, and originally, we said that we were going to do formative research, followed by developing a social media campaign, and then evaluate that social media campaign as our three aims. But along the way, we decided um, to go with a video instead that could be more targeted in how we use it. And so we have developed a video, which I mentioned earlier, and we evaluated the video. So now I'll tell you about the formative work that we did. Um, we did our data collection all by Zoom. We conducted key informant interviews and focus group discussions. Jasani Henry from Public Health and I did all of those interviews and excuse me, focus groups. We recruited MSM and transgender women for both of those things. And we also talked to some public health staff. For the focus group, we oversampled people representing the Latinx community because we felt that we hadn't done a great job of recruiting people from that population in the first round of work that we did in the first EHE supplement, and also people who are kind of in the younger to middle age range. We also did a salon presentation and elicited some feedback there on the information that we had already collected through our focus groups and uh, key informant interviews. And we recorded all of those interviews and focus group discussions, transcribed them, took notes, and then we used rapid coding and analysis to outline the key themes. And I should say that all of the people that were participated in the key informant interviews were people who were living with HIV, while as with the focus groups, we didn't ask people about their status. In some cases, people mentioned what their status was, but it wasn't a, a recruitment requirement or an eligibility criterion. My slides aren't advancing. Are they advancing for anyone else? There we go. Okay. So we used the same interview guide for both the key informant interviews and the focus group discussions. It was modified a little bit for the focus group discussions, but it was the same interview guide that we used for our earlier project, except this time we added some so social marketing questions to get at the best way to talk about these activities. So for example, one of the things that we asked was, is there a better, simpler, or easier way of saying molecular HIV surveillance so that it will be more understandable? We asked another question, a similar question about HIV cluster detection. We asked people about their concerns about molecular HIV surveillance and what they thought others might be concerned about. And we asked people what would prevent them from wanting to be a part of a molecular HIV surveillance investigation or other activities, and what would prevent other people that they knew from taking part. And finally, we asked people what would motivate them to participate in these investigations and what might motivate others to participate. So I'm gonna move on and show you the results from this formative work. We had a total of 28 respondents, 10 with key informant interviews, and 18 people took part in the focus group discussions. I've excluded the public health staff from this table, but you can see we had a mix of MSM and transgender women, and I think we were fairly successful in terms of recruiting people from the Latinx community. Um, we heard participants voice both support and concern about support for and concern about cluster detection and response. One participant said, I feel very comfortable with it. I strongly agree with it if it'll help to slow down the spread or even stop the spread of HIV. I think that it's a good thing. Another participant said, you got me at the get-go saying we're almost there with ending the HIV epidemic. We got to get rid of this, that's enough for me. And finally, that's going to be a preventive measure that's going to allow them, this is in reference to the health department, to reach their goal. And you know, getting those percentages down in the time frame they want, I think it's a good thing. On the other end of the spectrum, we heard some people have more negative views about cluster detection and response. 
Retribution is the term I'm thinking that you're going to be targeted, that you are going to be persecuted. And then another, uh, uh, this quote gets sort of at that idea of context that we found in our first project. Well, I'm from another state and they're not really known for being forward in their thinking about things like this. I am scared, I would be scared as a gay man to be in a situation there. I'm not as trusting of the government there as I am here. If you could find a way to make sure that the privacy rules were followed more closely in those places, I think it would be less of a concern for me. When we asked these questions about um, social marketing and how to refer to molecular HIV surveillance and cluster detection and response, the one thing that almost all of the participants said was don't use the word surveillance because it has really negative connotations. Other people noted that we should have an eye-catching visual and a catchy acronym. I'm not sure that we exceed, uh, succeeded on either of those points, but we did not use the word surveillance in our final uh, word name for the activity. These are some of the things that were su suggested by participants. You can see that a couple of people mentioned um, names with the word monitoring in them. And the other thing that came up fairly frequently was the idea of tracing, trace or tracing, which I think had a lot to do that this with the fact that we were doing this in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I think we started during the lockdown. And so contact tracing was on a lot of people's minds. And in the end, we decided to go with HIV tracing. And that is how we refer to sort of the suite of activities of molecular HIV surveillance and cluster detection and response in the video. This long list is the list of things that we came up with that we thought it would be important to address in the video. First, to explain what HIV tracing is, the steps of HIV tracing, the fact that HIV surveillance data are sent to the health department just as they are for other reportable diseases, the different ways that clusters are identified, how HIV tracing is a part of the ending the HIV epidemic, the goal of HIV tracing, and they wanted us to be sure to talk about confidentiality confidentiality and the privacy of people's data. They also suggested that we explain what HIV tracing can't do in terms of determining directionality or being used for criminalization, addressing immigration concerns, discussing the resources that are available during cluster detection and response during the investigations. We have to address the fear and stigma that might be related to HIV tracing, other common concerns, and acknowledge that different communities and different community members will have different perspectives and the connections within the community are important. So we were working at the time with the EHE advisory group for Public Health Seattle and King County and as a result of some of those conversations, we thought it would be important to develop a Spanish language video in tandem with the English version of the video. Uh, we didn't have funding in our budget from the CIFAR supplement to cover the cost of the additional video, but public health contributed that funding from their EAG funds. And while it was based on the same script and storyboard, we had native Spanish speakers who worked on it and um, were the people who appeared in the video. And so I'm sure that there were some modifications, but I couldn't tell you exactly what those modifications were. Um, this is how we went about developing the video. We provided that long list of topical areas to the public health staff that work on cluster detection and response to get their uh, thoughts and feedback. And after some revisions, we shared it with the marketing firm that we worked with, C plus C, which is a Seattle-based marketing agency. And then we moved into video production, which included identifying the format of the video, developing a script, making up both storyboards, English and Spanish, recruiting the talent for both the, the, uh, the actors or trusted messengers in the videos and the voiceover actors, 
Uh, then we shot the video, it went through production, we provided some feedback and asked for some revisions, and now we have the final video. And with that, um, oh, I wanted to discuss the video format. We decided to go, as I said, with a trusted messenger format, and we thought it was important to have three different people appear in the video, an epidemiologist, a DIS or disease intervention specialist and a person living with HIV who had taken part in a cluster investigation. We were hoping that epidemiologist could cover the information about HIV tracing and what it is. The DIS could talk about why it's important to do HIV tracing and the person who is living with HIV who had been a part of a cluster investigation could relate that experience. Uh, I wanted to include a few shots of the script and the storyboard because this was something that was totally new to me and I thought some of you might find it interesting as well. This is the initial script with the voiceover um, text. This is a shot of the first part of the storyboard and you'll see that many of these frames that are appearing on the storyboard are exactly the same in the video. And with that, I am going to start the video. And if there are any problems with sound or anything, please jump in and let me know. Roxanne, there is no sound. Um, Hmm. Let me play around with the sound a little bit. Yeah, I think if you click on that carrot by mute, mm -hmm. you get the option to do something. I don't remember what that makes it play your computer sound. Okay. I guess I should have tested this. Probably somebody else can tell you what to click on there. I'm looking at the options. I'm not seeing what you need to click on, but I think it's there. Natalie is saying in the chat that when you share, click share sound. Ah, where is that? Stop share. Stop click, share. Click, click share. And then um, at the bottom, you should see optimize for video clip and share sound. And click both of those and select the video and then click share in the right lower hand corner. You see those options, Roxanne? Did you see them, the little boxes? Roxanne, did you see the boxes? Yeah, okay. I did, can you hear me? Yeah, I can now, yeah. Uh, okay. I think you couldn't hear me when I started to share my slides. So let's see, I'll try it again. Sorry, everyone. No worries, I'm willing to wait to see this video. <laughs> so excited. Thank you, okay. Natalie, for your help. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Let's, yeah. let's hope this works. The plan to end the HIV epidemic is now underway in King County. Our goal is to reduce new HIV infections 90% by 2030. 
And to get there, we need to do four things. Diagnose early, treat effectively, prevent new infections, and identify and respond quickly when HIV clusters show up in our community. A cluster is a group of people with HIV infections. These people either have infection with the same strain of HIV or are concentrated in a particular time and place. Clusters indicate where HIV is spreading more rapidly. That's why it's so important for us to respond to clusters once we identify them. There are three steps to HIV tracing. Uh, one is to identify clusters. Two is to contact the people in those clusters. And three is to connect those people with resources to help them stay healthy and prevent further HIV transmission. So step one is to identify a cluster. And we do that by collecting lots of laboratory information and comparing genetic lab results from various HIV infections in the community. And we can be made aware of a cluster if lots of similar um, genetically related HIV infections come up around the same time or in the same place. So step two of HIV tracing is to reach out to people who may be part of a cluster. It's thought that about 10 times more HIV infections occur within clusters and so it's important to identify cluster members who maybe don't know their HIV status and get them tested and in care, or people who are untreated within the cluster. It's very important for people to understand that public health keeps everything private and confidential so that they know that we're not going to let anybody know their personal information and, and help them get what they need. Step three of HIV tracing is to get people hooked up with the services that they may need. Some of the resources available for people are if they need case managers that can help with things like housing and food and getting signed up for insurance so that they can get their labs and medical visits paid for. Sometimes people want resources for like people to talk to on an ongoing basis. And so we have ways to get people hooked up with those kind of resources. When I was first contacted um, by a clinician at Public Health, they assured me everything would be completely confidential everything that I told them, all the questions that I asked. I received a lot of um, help and got resources for care from the clinician at Public Health. And so that was truly life-saving um, mental and physical care that I received as a result of those conversations. This was a safe place to start asking questions and get resources, um, all, you know, free to me, nothing. There's no agenda there. What I tell someone if they were kind of unsure about why they were being contacted at Public Health. Their only goal here is to help you and help you get the care that you need and also help stop the spread of HIV in our community. It's been proven. HIV tracing gets people the care and resources they need. Being in care prevents new HIV infections and improves the health of the community. Together, we can end the HIV epidemic. Okay, so that was the video. I just wanted to briefly touch on the Spanish language video. For the Spanish language video, we had Dr. Santiago Neme, who is an infectious disease physician, um, serve in the role of epidemiologist. Uh, Angela Nunez from Public Health Seattle and King County was the DIS appearing in that video. And unfortunately, we're, we were unable to find someone who spoke Spanish that had been a part of a cluster investigation to appear in that video. So what we ended up doing was taking the video of Colton talking and describing his experience and putting subtitles in Spanish on the bottom of the frames. Um, now I'm going to talk about the video evaluation. Before I jump into that, are there any um, clarifying questions up until this point? No? Okay. See in the chat. Okay. So for the video evaluation, we put together a pre-post video online survey using REDCap. We recruited, again, MSM and transgender women. 
both people living with HIV and people living not living with HIV, most of whom were taking PrEP. We recruited both English and Spanish speakers, and we conducted recruitment through the CIFAR Research Registry at Madison Clinic, the Sexual Health Clinic PrEP program, uh, via Andre Hermano's uh, social media, media channels, and through a Spanish-speaking public health Seattle and King County DIS. A survey link for the most part was emailed to participants after someone had asked them about it and it would, the email contained talking points about what the project was about. People who completed the survey received a $30 digital gift card. We really wanted the survey to be short and sweet and to the point. And because of that, we didn't collect any demographic data. We did collect information about whether people were living with HIV on PrEP or fell in another category and whether people wanted to take the survey in English or Spanish, but that was all that we had for demographics. Um, we embedded the video within the survey to keep from losing people if, if they would have to go out to another app or program and then come back. Our original goal was to recruit 50 participants to um, be in the evaluation or take these surveys. And the analysis is all descriptive statistics, mostly percentages about how people answered these questions. So uh, we ended up having a little funding left over for participant incentives and we recruited 85 total participants. 12 of whom stopped at the video and never came back to finish the survey. So they don't have any of the answers to the questions after the video. And so I've re restricted the results that I'm showing you to the 73 people who completed the full survey. And the participant characteristics in terms of whether they were living with HIV, taking PrEP or in another group are shown in the figure on the right hand side of the slide. You can see of the total, about 60% of people were living with HIV and about a third were taking PrEP. Um, among people who took the survey in English, the larger proportion were people living with HIV, while among people who, who took the survey in Spanish, a much larger proportion were people who reported that they were taking PrEP. I also want to call your attention to the fact that we only had 10 people take the survey in Spanish and watch the Spanish video. So that's a very small number and take the results for the people who took the Spanish survey with a grain of salt. Because of those issues about context and people feeling differently depending on whether they had had interactions with a health department before, we also included questions about whether they had ever been contacted by a health department. The question was read, have you ever been contacted by the staff of any public health department in regards to a health condition? Um, so just under half said they had been contacted by a health department. And a little over a third said that they had been contacted by Public Health Seattle and King County specifically for a health condition. We started out the survey by asking people whether they had ever heard or knew about the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative. You can see here all, uh, across all of these questions, people living with HIV are in the blue column, people taking PrEP are in the orange column, people who took the survey in English are in the gray column, and people who took the survey in Spanish are in the sort of yellowish gold column. So there was very little awareness of the EHE initiative or of cluster detection and response, but more awareness of the HIV tracing, which I find interesting. And I wondered when I first saw these results, if it might be because people were conflating HIV tracing with HIV partner services or contact tracing. But over a quarter of all of these groups said that they were aware of HIV tracing. And interestingly, among the people who took the survey in Spanish, they were more likely to say that they are, were aware of all of these things than the other groups were. We asked people both before and after the video if they thought that Public Health Seattle and King County should contact people who are part of HIV outbreaks or clusters. And you can see here that over 90% of all of four of these groups said that public health should contact people who are part of HIV clusters. 
we asked whether or how important contacting people who are part of clusters is on a Likert scale ranging from one to five, where five is very important. And the bars show the proportion of people who responded very important. So three quarters of all of the groups responded very important to that question. And then finally, we asked on a scale of one to five, how likely would you be to respond to public health if they contacted you and informed you that you were part of an HIV cluster? And here you can say, see that the proportions who responded that they were very likely to respond went down again, except among the people who took the survey in Spanish where it stayed fairly safe, stable. I also wanted to look at this by the groups defined by whether they had ever been contacted by a health department or public health Seattle and King County. So this slide shows the answers to the same questions. The dark green is people who had never been contacted by any health department. Light green are people who had been contacted by a health department. Dark purple is people who haven't been contacted by public health Seattle and King County and lavender were people who have been contacted by public health here. So you can see from this first group, there wasn't a lot of difference for people who said that public health should contact cluster members across the four groups. There was maybe a little bit of difference, um, a wider difference for people who had been contacted by public health Seattle and King County um, for the question about whether contacting cluster members was important and how important. And then a little more spread again for the question about how likely you would be to respond with more people who had been part of a public health investigation in King County saying that they would be very likely to respond while fewer who hadn't been part of one of those investigations said that they would respond. And interestingly, there was no difference between the people who had been contacted by any health department or not been contacted by any health department. So this is the point in the survey where people watched the video and then we asked some of similar questions to them after the video. And this one was really hard to improve upon. Should public health contact people who are in clusters because before they watched the video, 93% of response, respondents said that public health should contact people. After the video, it went up to 96. And among the, the five people who said no, public health shouldn't contact people who are part of clusters, uh, before they watched the video, four of them moved over into the yes column after they watched the video. Whoops. This is the question about how important it is that public health contacts people who are part of HIV outbreaks or clusters. And again, it's the proportion of people who answered that it's very important. The dark blue bars show the responses across these groups before they watch the video and the purple, or excuse me, the orange show the proportion who answered very important after they watched the video. So here we see movement in a positive direction for all of the groups, except among the people who took the survey in Spanish. Um, again, those are small numbers, so it's hard to say a lot, but there are a couple of other things that make me think that maybe we have a little more work to do with the Spanish video that will be coming up. So here we had a very small number of people who before they watched the video responded other than very important to that question about how important is it that public health contacts people. So these are all the people that said something other than very important. And I looked at their responses after they watched the video and you can see that for the total, for people living with HIV and people who took the English survey, there was good movement with a lot of people moving into the very important category, which is the taller blue bar. And you can see the distribution across the other categories here. I didn't include the um, didn't include the people who are taking prep or people who took the Spanish survey on this figure because there were just so such small numbers, uh, it wouldn't even be informative. And I also highlighted the access title on this slide because I wanted to point out that it's numbers instead of percentage, percentages. I think I skipped ahead. No, here we go. 
So again, after watching the video, we asked people whether they were more or less likely to respond to public health if public health contacted them and informed them that they were part of an HIV cluster. So pretty much across the board, all of these groups, two thirds of people after they watched the video said that they were more likely to respond with the next biggest group being um, people who said that they were the same, except again, among the people who took the survey in Spanish where two people actually said that they were less likely after watching the video. When I limited these numbers to just the people who said that they were not very likely to respond before the video. Again, we see movement in the appropriate direction with um, two thirds of people in the, of the total group, the people living with HIV and people who took the survey in English, moving to say that they were more likely to respond after they watched the video. We also asked a couple of questions at the end of the survey about acceptability and confidentiality. And this slide shows the um, results for the acceptability question. So in response to this very long question on a scale of one to five, where one is not at all acceptable, and five is very acceptable. How acceptable are the activities described in the video? For example, identifying HIV clusters and contacting people in the clusters to make sure they're in HIV care or to connect them to services. So these are the proportions of people who answered very acceptable. Again, the total across people living with HIV or taking PrEP, people who took the survey in English, people who took the survey in Spanish, and then these last two bars are people who had been contacted by any health department previously and people who have been contacted by Public Health Seattle and King County previously. So a pretty large majority of people said that these activities are very acceptable with the lowest proportion among the people who took the survey in Spanish. And I wanted to also look at the next sort of tick down on the Likert scale. So when you take into account the slightly acceptable and very acceptable, the numbers go up a bit more, but they were already pretty high, so it's not a huge jump. So um, on a scale of one to five, these are the four and five responses in the light blue bars. Here's a question about concern about confidentiality. After watching this video on a scale of one to five, how concerned are you that the information that the health department might collect about you is not confidential or private? And the dark blue bars show the proportion of people who said that they were very concerned. So here we see the group of people who are taking PrEP saying that they were very concerned. And again, when we combined the two kind of higher bumps on the Likert scale, the higher ticks, this is the light blue bars show very concerned and slightly concerned. So the numbers go up a lot when you can include people who say that they were slightly concerned. So that might be worth some discussion, is which is the category that we should be aiming for. So a quick summary of these results, our formative work with people living with HIV and other MSM and transgender women elicited both positive and negative reactions to HIV tracing and the activities that fall under that umbrella. Even before they watched the video, over 90% of participants supported public health contacting people who are part of clusters, no matter how you defined the groups. A somewhat smaller proportion said that they were very likely to respond to public health about a cluster investigation. And after they watched the video, most of the changes that we saw in response after the video were in a positive direction. So we were seeing good changes. Um, 71 to 91% of respondents said that HIV tracing activities were very acceptable after watching the video. And there was some indication that respondents to the Spanish survey had more concerns than people who took the English survey. So I think that might require a little follow-up um, that we should do, I don't know if we'll be able to do it, but um, definitely need some more work. I would say that would be a next step for this project. 
Some limitations of the project include that our formative data might not be representative of other populations in King County or similar populations in other counties or health jurisdictions. Our interviews and focus group discussions were conducted in English only, and that is something that I would try to change if I could, if we were going to do this all over again. A large proportion of the people who were participated in our key informant interviews who were living with HIV had been living with HIV for many years and were recruited from Madison Clinic. So they were people who were stable and in care for the most part, I'm assuming. There are definitely limits to the amount of material that we could pack into a three to five minute video. So um, I think we did pretty well, but I'd be interested in people's thoughts on that. And finally, again, we had small numbers of people complete the evaluation survey in Spanish. I know that there were Spanish speakers taking the survey who took it in English based on what I was hearing from the people who were doing the recruiting at different times. Um, and so it would be interesting if we could, if we knew which people they were and whether they answered differently than the people who took the survey in Spanish, but we don't really have any way of doing that. Uh, it would be good to have more people complete that survey in Spanish to get a better sense um, of what people are thinking and their reactions to the video and these activities. So in closing, I would say that there is a tension between the community wanting more information about these kinds of activities that the public health department is doing and the health department's concern over providing too much information and invoking anxiety that they feel is unwarranted. So the question there is what is the right amount of transparency for the health department? Um, and my second question is whether doing local outreach and engagement about this work is really the right way to go. I think that if CDC had done a similar sort of thing before they rolled out a lot of these activities, um, it probably would have been more effective. And I know that someone at the San Diego CIFAR has an R01 grant to develop a video similar to ours, but that will be based on input that they receive from a variety of communities around the country. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. I would say based on the challenges with recruiting people to take the survey and watch the video in Spanish that we definitely need more support for recruitment and encouraging participation of a linguistically diverse population in King County. And finally, I think this, um, the pandemic uh, as awful as it has been is maybe an opportunity for public health to capitalize on people's familiarity with contact tracing and the public health department's work to stop transmission. Um, I don't know exactly how to do that, but definitely I felt like when I was doing the interviews and the focus groups that people had a really good understanding of contact tracing and the point of contact tracing. And I feel that this is something that we probably could make use of. I'd like to acknowledge all of the participants, those people from public health who ap appeared in the video, as well as Dr. Neme and Colton, people who helped recruit participants for the survey from both the CIFAR Research Registry and the Sexual Health Clinic, as well as staff at Entre Hermanos. I'd like to thank the CIFAR for funding this work and C plus C for the great work that they did. Uh, C plus C was the marketing firm for anyone who joined late. And that is the end of my slides. I am happy to take questions if anyone has them. And I hope you have questions. Okay. Do you want to read out that quote that you had up? I don't know about others, but I didn't finish reading it when you turned it off. Oh, sure. I like, this is one of my favorite quotes from the first project. It makes me laugh every time I read it. It seems like the scientists and the researchers and the public health folks are all really excited and jazzed about this new tool they have, and they want to get out there and use it. And they've got their glasses on, and they're nerdy and excited about this MHS tool. And then the quote went on to talk about how um, 
a lot of people were not as excited and that public health was maybe letting their excitement get in the way of doing good community engagement. I just enjoy the part about the nerdy classes. Natalie, did you have a question? Sorry. Yeah, yes, actually. Um, so what now? What, what do you do with this information now? So the video is available on the public health website. And I know that they have been able to direct people that they're contacting for cluster investigations to the video so that if people have concerns or misgivings and they think that the video will help. Um, other than that, we're still sort of discussing how we will use it. Mm -hmm. We did show it to a group at CDC and they're interested in maybe working with us to do something similar, I think, or sharing the video. I'm not sure, we haven't talked to them for a while. So mm -hmm. um, I would say we don't have definite long-term plans other than making it available on the website. Right, um, I know uh, this, this summer I'm actually doing a, um, embedded fellowship with uh, Alameda County. Mm -hmm. and so this may be something I, I would be open to looking into translating in another area, possibly another population. And can reach out to you because um, I'll be doing HIV, looking at HIV cluster transmissions and um, this may be actually a good addition. Perfect. To that. Yeah. I could also introduce you to the group at UC San Diego that is has the R01 to develop a video as well. They might also have some good input. Okay, great, great, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll reach out and write you. That sounds good. I think I saw something from Joanne about a bombshell in the chat. I'm wondering if you and or Susan have talked about the increasing evidence that baseline resistance testing is no longer cost effective in the INSTE era. Um, I have no idea if the guidelines are going to change, but clearly fewer docs are going to order testing that cluster investigations could then use. And the ones that are clinically required are going to, are going to overrepresent certain populations. Are you planning to do any work with providers to support this pillar so they continue to order tests? Will they need to consent patients if tests are being ordered for non-clinical purposes? Wow, those are all the questions, Joanne. I invite Susan to step in. Uh, we don't have any funding for this project to do really anything else, um, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna punt to Susan. I don't have an answer to that, though. Um, my, my best answer is that I've seen CDC uh, staff talk to clinicians about the importance of continuing to do uh, genetic sequencing for surveillance reasons and not clinical reasons. But at that point, I think that the clinical reasons were you know, of higher importance. And you know, I, I see your point. Joanne about it decreasing the importance. I still think um, it's really important to continue to monitor um, all types of resistance, including INSTE resistance, hoping that there are, um, if not individual clinical needs, but public health needs, that doctors understand that it's important to keep our fingers on the pulse of developing INSTE resistance the you know the old three classes so it's the best I can say at this time um, I would love to work with anybody who would like to work with providers to try and get the word out but I assume that should be another provider rather than a PhD researcher who would lead that type of a charge. Joanne do you have any thoughts suggestions? Sorry, I'm on treadmill. I've taken off the video. But uh, no, I mean, I just heard about it recently. There are new cost-effective analyses, as I mentioned. So I think this is all really new. But I think CDC and NIH have put in a huge amount of money 
towards this work. And so just starting to think about it, but things are going to change and perhaps not in the direction that everybody's been planning. So mostly just wanted to bring it to your attention if you haven't been already. Sorry for my breathlessness. It's okay, it's thank you, Joanne. No, that, that's important for us to know. Thank you for bringing that up. And um, I, you know, for once, maybe the fact that when research comes out and before it becomes clinically um, adopted is usually way too long of a time. Maybe for once that will be in our favor in this case. Uh, I see that Natalie asked what the project budget was in the chat, and it was $100,000, which included uh, salary for myself and people at public health. It included the marketing firm. It included all of the incentives, developing the REDCap survey, the Spanish translation. Wow. Um, <laughs> in that $100,000. Yeah, it um, was... It was, thank goodness that we had that additional funding from public health though, or we would not have been able to do the Spanish video. Yeah, um, I think Joanne's comment uh, triggered a question in my mind that I may not be understanding um, the clustering and tracing. Um, is the provider ordering a genotype uh, what's leading to the, the detection of these clusters? The provider who orders drug resistance testing that those results, the HIV genetic sequence is reportable to the health department. So the health department gets those genetic sequences. Yeah. Whenever someone orders one of those tests. Okay. Well, okay. Whenever, yeah, wow. That's, um, that is interesting and does put something in the, <laughs> If it's not automatically done, like it, it probably needs to be automatically done by the lab instead of triggered by the, the provider order. I am not familiar enough with how that usually happens. So Susan, mm -hmm. I'll ask you if you have any input here too. Yeah, I think that's uh, dependent on each healthcare organization what their automatic things are. Um, I think most healthcare providers still at the time of staging and a new positive will do the CD4 viral load and drug resistance as well as you know the creatinine and other things that might be needed to, or not creatinine, that's for prep, um, but you know, start a person on anti yeah, so so I guess I guess what I'm I'm getting at is, and this may be just different because I'm here in California, is that in, in certain populations that I work with, is there are a large number of people who are being diagnosed uh, during outreach or with community-based organizations, and therefore there's not a provider drawing blood work. Mm. And so if they're out in the field and and like I'm, my EH work that I'm doing. Um, which will involve some blood work, but let's say not. Like I do point of care HIV testing, and then based on um, on the, and that's day zero, and it's positive. You know, I may start rapid treatment right there and draw some blood or get them to the lab. Um, but I'm saying if I'm not there and it's the community based organization, they're not going to do that, and so you'll have days to labs and then clustering, you know, you, you'd have these days of, of a gap. I don't know if I'm coming across clear because I'm, I'm thinking through this as I speak, um, where people would not be able to detect a cluster. Right, when there's, yeah, a treat right after test and the viral load suppresses quickly, then the only time we're likely to get a drug resistance test is when there's treatment failure. So luckily, this is not our only cluster detection method, mm -hmm. one of our most robust ones. Okay. Because we've been able to identify clusters from our DIS, doing partner services interviews, and other jurisdictions have been able to find clusters because of provider reporting, um, not based on genetic similarities, but based on um, like 
in Lowell and what was the other city in Massachusetts, I think they identified their clusters because the providers saw a bump up in new cases. Um, and we also look at time space clustering as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It might not be the death knell of our ability to identify clusters and try and mean without the genetic sequence, but certainly okay. break the backbone of it as it's been successful in, in our county. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. So let's see, there's been some other things in the chat. Um, Susan Mello asked, where else are you presenting the results, Roxanne? Are you presenting them at the EHE meeting in Birmingham? Sorry, I muted myself. Yes, I am presenting them at the EHE meeting. And Susan also asked about the National CIFAR CAB Coalition, um, whether you could present there as well. I might be able to do that. Maybe we can talk about it later, Susan. I don't know the details of that meeting. And then Brian says, um, thanks for this great work, Roxanne. Many are working on this at the state and national level and can benefit from the groundwork you've laid. My main remaining, I think that's thought, is on the question you posed, what are the right level of transparency? What is the right level of transparency? The video clearly designed, the video is clearly designed to increase support for MHS, CDR, but community members who've studied this closely will note certain aspects are missing from the video that may raise concerns. Any comment? I know that there are a couple of things that we decided not to go into because they didn't really come up in the formative work that we did. And I think that that is sort of a dichotomy, Brian. And I agree with you that people who have thought about this and talked about it a lot understand more of the nuances and the potential limitations and potential misuses of the data. Um, but most of these, most of the people that we talked to for the formative work didn't bring those things up, which is why we didn't address them in the video. And I assume that you're talking about things like criminalization and consent, consent for the use of the HIV genetic sequences. And I think that I'm gonna be seeing you tomorrow. So maybe we can talk more about this then. Is it tomorrow or next week? I think that's Thursday. Oh, okay, Thursday. Uh, but yeah, fully agree. Thanks for those. It's a tough balance to strike, for sure. Oh, I I should um, just wrap us up because it's one after one, and I really want to thank Roxanne. And there's other coming in in the chat as well. So thank you. Wonderful presentation. Wonderful projects that have really helped us present this work and importance. And I will say that uh, our next talk will be July 19th. Jane Lee will be talking about um, MSM and Latin Latinx MSM. So thank you everyone for coming and have a good afternoon.